you are so forward and you're now becoming part of the brain that is uniquely human. We have a prefrontal cortex that is so big, our ape cousins probably think we are really ugly because our foreheads have pushed out because of the prefrontal region and we don't look like our ape relatives. But it's this prefrontal cortex that you could call the cortex humanitas. It is capable of doing an amazing set that is processing energy and information in a way that creates representations of information um, that as far as we can tell, most other animals can't do. For example, telling stories, um, sitting together and having a meeting like this, obviously inventing stuff where you can project things all over the planet, you know, and look at little dots flying up and see where the globe is and, you know, where Google is, you know, being used by people in different languages. I mean, you know, I, as far as we know, you know, rats don't do that and even apes don't do that. Other animals are great, but we do some pretty wild things, you know. And we believe that's because our prefrontal cortex is so distant from the physical world because it's anterior in the cortex, it can make new combinations that we call creativity that are the thrust of this capacity. But the prefrontal cortex, while it's creative in this way, it also anchors us in some very interesting ways in relationships. And let me give you an example. Um, the first thing to say is like any part of the brain, there are many parts. So here we're talking about the prefrontal area, which is your, represented from your last knuckles to your fingernails. The side part, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just the side area, is very important for when you put something in the front of your mind. So if you have a computer program, for example, and you want someone to remember something and then you change screens and they're going on to something else, you want to know how is this, what's called the chalkboard of the mind, holding on to that piece of data. And it used to be said that we can hold on to seven plus or minus two items. People actually don't believe that anymore. Not because we're changing, but because it's a reinterpretation of the research. That in, in, in daily life, it's probably more like three, two or three items. So just in terms of what you present on a screen before the screen moves, it's just something to think about. Uh, what this dorsolateral is really able to hold in the chalkboard of the mind. But for our purposes, we're going to look now at the middle prefrontal area. And for those of you who like to know names, I'll tell you what I'm including in the middle prefrontal cortex. So if you look up the research, you'll know what the anatomical names are. This includes an area called the anterior cingulate, the orbital frontal, the dorsal and medial aspects of the medial prefrontal. I'm sorry, the dorsal and the ventral aspects of the medial prefrontal and the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex which includes an area called the insula. Now, everyone's going, oh, no, too much Greek. So don't worry about all that. That's why I made up this term called middle, right? So we have the side and we have the middle, because it's very easy to remember for your dorsolateral <laughs> to remember that. So the middle prefrontal cortex is unbelievably important. And if you're thinking about mental health, as I hope you'll see in a moment, the list I'm about to give you is an unbelievable list that helps describe, not define, but I think describe what you may consider to be a mentally healthy life. So let's look at this list. And here's the clinical case I told you I would tell you about. Obviously, the details are changed to protect confidentiality, but this is the essence of the case. Um, a child stopped talking in school. I'm a child psychiatrist, so she's brought to me for treatment. She refuses to talk in school. And one day, as we're playing games and stuff in silence, she finds a video recorder, this is before DVDs existed, a video recorder, um, and she gets very excited. So she brings in a video the next session, and on the video is this beautiful depiction that her father was taking, it was her father's birthday, of her mother and herself playing together and dancing around and really hugging each other and looking each other in the eye in something that's called attuned communication, where two people, two individuals, become a we. Absolutely exquisite. But what I came to realize when she then said, that's the way my mother used to be for the first time she spoke in the office, was that something had happened to this mom 
And when the mom came in, and I had heard the story, but I didn't understand the impact of it, the mom had had a car accident a year earlier. And unfortunately, she was not wearing a seat belt, and she, there were no airbags. It was an old car. And the steering wheel hit her in the forehead, right in the area where this middle prefrontal area is. And she had severe damage, was in a coma for a while, had brain surgery, had plastic surgery. She actually looked pretty good. But she behaved totally differently than the woman in the video, who was tuned, attuned, who was present, who seemed it would be flexible. Now this mom had severe problems in the way she could relate to her children. There, this girl had other siblings as well. She seemed like a different human being, the husband said. So I took the brain scans from the neurosurgeon with me under my arm, and I went to the medical school library, and I looked up everything I could find in the basic research on what these areas of the prefrontal cortex did. And as I was gathering all that data, I had a session with the mom and the dad alone without the kids there, and I asked the mom, what was life like since the accident? And she says, matter-of-factly, well, I guess if I had to put a word to it, I, I guess I would say I've lost my soul. And this was exactly what the kids were having such a hard time articulating. There was something in the essence, whatever you believe about the word soul, you just think of that, the idea of the essence of our personality, of who we are, this core place of ourselves. There was something about this essence that was gone. And yet she could walk, she could talk, she could write, she could think. So when I brought back the information from the scans, which I'm going to describe to you now, and explained it to the family, we could start to make sense of why things had changed so much. Here are nine functions that now we know from research are based on, that is, they need a healthy middle prefrontal area to function well. And you just think about in your own life what role these nine functions play in yourself, in your relationships with others, in people you know. And here are the nine functions. The first is this area of the brain actually sits on top of the brain stem, as you can see from where it is, and it helps regulate it. So regulating the body, the heart, the lungs, is actually what this part contributes to, body regulation. Number two is, you know when you look at another person in the face and you feel like you're connected to them and you attuned to them? That attuned communication depends on this middle prefrontal area. And when it's damaged, people don't do that. And you can try it right now if you want to, look at each other and see what it's like when you just look at someone you feel connected versus when one of, the, one of you looks away. Give it a try. Just see what that's like. Look at your neighbor, try looking and then just look, even, even just look away and see, see the difference in the feeling. Each of you try on the left side, do the looking away first. And then on this side, now try switching it over. How did it feel differently when someone was actually, looked like they felt like they were tuning into you versus not? Did you notice a difference? Yeah, everyone's nodding their head. There's a huge difference, and the prefrontal region can create it and knows the difference. Number three is to be able to balance your emotions, to let these internal valence states, we call emotions, rise enough so life has meaning, but not rise too much so life becomes chaotic, and not be too depleted so life becomes rigid. That optimal flow, which we'll talk about in just a moment, that optimal flow is what this area helps create. The fourth function is the capacity to extinguish fear. If you've been traumatized or it's a difficult thing or you're frightened of it, this area actually grows what are called GABA fibers. Gamma aminobutyric acid is an inhibitory peptide that helps dampen down firing. And the lower limbic area, the amygdala, is responsible for generating activations that are what help us feel fear. So this middle prefrontal area helps calm that down. That's number four. Number five is the ability to pause before you act, what I call response flexibility. To instead of just active, you know, respond to your impulse, to pause, have a space in your mind 
where you consider the various options available to you. For a kid on a playground, this is absolutely all the difference between being adaptive and flexible with emotional intelligence and social intelligence or lacking those things. That ability to pause before you act is everything. And if you could just teach kids that, you'd be making a huge difference in public schools. That's number five. Number six is something called insight, which scientifically means something called autonoetic consciousness, which is self-knowing awareness. And in the brain, what we think that does is there are representations of the past that are connected with representations of the present and anticipated future. So you have this thing called mental time travel. The next one is the capacity for empathy. Different from attunement, empathy is the ability to tune into someone else and to create maps of them in your mind. I wonder what that person